Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Susie Cranston, Executive Vice President of First Republic Investment Management and member of the Commonwealth Board of Governors. I am delighted to be the chair for today's program and pleased to say that our program is being sponsored by First Republic. First Republic is a long-standing supporter of the Commonwealth Club. We value the important programs the club brings to the public, including today's conversation with distinguished guest, John Hope Bryant. First Republic Bank shares John Hope Bryant's commitment to financial inclusion, economic empowerment, and financial dignity. We also thank our audience for the support of the Commonwealth Club. If you wish to make a donation, please text the word DONATE in all capitals to 415-329-4231. We also want to remind you to submit questions for our guest via the chat room next to your screen. Our moderator will get to as many as possible later in the program. And now I am pleased to introduce John Hope Bryant, entrepreneur, philanthropist, founder and chairman of Operation Hope Incorporated, and now author of the new book, up From Nothing, The Untold Story of How We All Succeed. John Hope Bryant says American opportunity is not dead. In his new book, he outlines the mindset and practices that he says will allow all of us to achieve the American dream, no matter what our current circumstances. He discusses his own rise from humble beginnings and argues that individually, we can change our mindset from survivor to thriver to winner and move beyond just getting by or being financially independent to becoming wildly successful. Mr. Bryant is a prominent thought leader on how to expand economic opportunity, as well as financial dignity and inclusion. His Operation Hope is the largest nonprofit provider of financial literacy and economic empowerment services in the United States for youth and adults. Mr. Bryant is also founder and principal of the Promise Homes Company, the largest minority controlled owner of single family rental homes in the United States. He has also been listed as one of Time Magazine's 50 Leaders for the Future, and the last five United States presidents have recognized him for his work. Mr. Bryant is responsible for financial literacy becoming the policy of the US federal government, and his list of numerous awards include Oprah Winfrey's Use Your Life Award and the Commonwealth Club's own Distinguished Citizen Award. Today, Mr. Bryant will be in conversation with Brian Watt, KQED radio news anchor. Mr. Watt previously served as a producer in NPR's Marketplace and won the Los Angeles Press Club's first place award for business and financial reporting. Get ready for an inspired discussion with real world advice for achieving financial security. I am now pleased to welcome John Hope Bryan and Brian Watt. Thank you, Ms. Cranston. Hello, everybody. I want to start with the dedication of your book, John Hope Bryant. Uh, it's good to see you again. Yeah. You dedicate this book to Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd and the long list of others whose lives were taken yet seen so that finally the struggle for justice for Black America might finally be told. What role do you hope to play in the telling of this struggle? Well, before I say anything, I want to thank you uh, for all that you have done. You reminded me of the Bankers Bus Tours in Los Angeles. Um, you reminded me of your work uh, in, before KQED, where you're the anchor, with marketplace and uh, other places of uh, of communicated thought leadership uh, in Los Angeles and now in the Bay Area, uh, and uh, I I know well of your legacy and want to thank you for leaning in. Um, without the media, Dr. King would never have had a movement. Um, it just never it, it was a, an essential part of his strategy. Uh, so it's not an afterthought. It is uh, it is a uh, is a parallel thought that folks like you get the memo, so to speak, and are involved. Um, I also want to acknowledge, uh, and I don't normally do this, but uh, First Republic Bank is actually just a very cool bank. Uh, I'm chair of their advisory board. Uh, I did not know in advance that they were sponsoring this, uh, but they are they are just a very cool bank. They have, they have, their CEO, James Herbert, is a class act. 
they, you know, you wait for somebody, you wait for the shoe to drop often, you know, like it's somebody gonna, Brian, they're gonna sort of underwhelm you <laughs> based on what you've, what they've advertised, promoted. These folks actually walk their talk and they're actually, they're actually human beings, not just bankers. I mean, they, they genuinely live their values. And I just, am, I'm just, I'm very proud that they're associated with this program today. Um, I, um, I believe we're sitting in a moment in history and I'm also honored to have received the, the, the uh, distinguished award from uh, the Commonwealth Club. So I was very excited about today. I have much, hold you guys in much high respect. Um, we're sitting in a moment in history. I believe right now, and but history doesn't feel historic when you're sitting in it. It just sort of feels like another day. But that doesn't mean the moment we're in is actually not historic. Uh, and um, we, when we met, I don't believe that was necessarily a moment of history. I think that was an important moment. I think it was a stepping stone. It was a bridge building moment. Over 28 years, we've been at this at Operation Hope. But I think this moment is different. Um, and the only reason I don't say I know it's different is because I'm I'm not <laughs> him. Right. But I think it's different. I feel it's different. Every fiber of my bones. But I think we've got to move from a, from protesting in the streets to operationalizing a business plan in the C-suites, mm-hmm. whether they be City Hall, mm-hmm. whether they be Capitol, okay? whether they be in the community leaders, uh, executive director's office, uh, whether it be in the pastor's pastoral office, whether it be in the bankers, uh, C-suite level offices, whether it be in Silicon Valley uh, conference rooms. Um, We have got to move this movement to a point now where we're operating from the shoulders up or the neck up versus the shoulders down. We got to move from this and this and this and (laughs) to this. And and, uh, you know, it's an interesting factoid, Brian, that 100% of the in-place, in-neighborhood in shootings of Blacks by police officers in the last five years or so um, have been in 500 credit score neighborhoods. Mm. Interesting mm. factoid. Um, they've not been in 700 credit score neighborhoods, not where people live now. There's been a couple of situations where somebody driving through someplace and got pulled over. That's the exception, not the rule. Uh, 99% of these were in neighborhood. George Floyd was in neighborhood. And um, and that to me is economic and cultural and, and class. And um, so I think you can solve some of these issues of social injustice through economic equity. And in your book, you you know, you do a deep dive. I mean, that is a fan, that is a statistic that no one had ever really considered the credit score of the neighborhood where these shootings and these moments are taking place. But you also really zero in on the fact that only 2% of businesses owned by one person or are owned by African-Americans. How how do we change that? That strikes me as the beginning here. Yeah. So because you're a big, deep brain, Brian, you said that in a way that people have to sit and wrap their heads around what you said. Let me see if I can flip it and say it a different different way. 90, there are just under 3 million Black businesses in America before COVID-19. 96% of them don't have an employee. They're sole proprietors. Right. So you don't have wealth creation. You, you don't have job creation. Uh, you're not creating scale. You're not solving social problems through free enterprise, uh, which proper companies do. Proper companies mean those who have balance sheets and infrastructure and systems and employees and um, and are building wealth. Uh, that you can solve social problems through. In fact, that's what happened in the 1960s. We'll hopefully get that in a in a part of this conversation. It was the private sector that integrated the South, uh, the Southern states of America in the 1960s, not the government. The government actually was the problem. The government was the government leaders were standing in the hallway saying over my dead body in some strange ways, very much like the governments, some government leaders are doing today being a, an obstructionist, being a problem and not being part 
of the solution, but it was the private sector that weighed in. So uh, I, I do believe we need to look at these challenges through a different lens. And I, as you well know, um, uh, because you're a thinker, I went all the way back <laughs> uh, to slavery. And I even dealt with what people mostly consider a, an immoral, unethical, disgusting, all, it's all that's true. But, but I, you know, they, that's where the conversation typically stops. It's racism. It's just, to me, that's where the conversation begins. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's far from what really happened. Mm -hmm. You know, you mention slavery in various places in your book, but there's the passage that I thought it would be great to hear you read is actually in the introduction. Uh, it's, uh, it's the part that you call America the Green. Um, can, you, can you just read that passage? I feel like it gives people who are joining us a, a good sense of sort of what you're getting at in this moment in this book. Um, you, you, mind, uh, we, we, you mind grabbing that and giving us a, giving us a few bars of that? Yeah, no problem. And you actually, you actually, you, you've inspired me to, uh, to create a reading series for the book. So I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna read the whole book 10 minutes at a time over from after Thanksgiving all the way through uh, for Christmas, uh, for those who are interested. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, America, the green is on page six for those who've got it. Yeah. The new color for America is green. And yet it's also, but and yet it's also always been green, not white, black, red, brown, or yellow, as in race, not red or blue, as in partisan politics, green, as in the color of U.S. currency. Are there race and racism issues in America? That's like asking if rain is real. Yes, of course there are. My black ancestors were absolutely limited by and because of racism. To a lesser degree, I have been too. Racism was at the base of slavery and the slave trade in America. But that was underneath, uh, but what was underneath that base was money and economics. Slave labor was a wealth building tool the building of wealth on the literal backs of others. Africans weren't enslaved only because Europeans saw them as an inferior race. Africans were brought to America because they were agricultural geniuses with an insane work ethic, even under the most extreme conditions. Let me include the talk here about politics. Of course, politics are important Many of our greatest wins uh, for both the mainstream and the underserved have been achieved through the political narrative. But underneath politics and driving it is money and economics. War, too. No country goes to war just to save a country of poor people. It's all too often more like 95% of the time about that country's economic relevance. So let's not get into a sidetracked emotional argument about and around race or politics here, because those uh, induce anger. This is how they get you. They take you off track. They distract you. They make you un unfocused and emotional. Complaining about our reality is not going to get our kids into college. Complaining is not a business plan. In fact, it messes with your business plan. For what it's worth, payback is not a business plan either. Reparations are absolutely needed, but by themselves, reparations are not how we will win. We need to get our priorities right. Let's put our focus back on the green. Thanks very much. You are joining us from Atlanta, yeah, and I met you in Los Angeles. Can you talk about why you think Atlanta is a model for American capitalism and how it can all work well? There's a lot we want to know about Georgia right now. It's the hot spot, 
But uh, let, let's talk about what you see there in Atlanta as something that the rest of the country can learn from. Well, Atlanta, uh, and I don't believe that George is a hot spot now by accident, by the way, uh, maybe to make a bit more context after I finish your answer. Uh, Atlanta, in my opinion, is the moral center of America. Hmm. Um, I would argue it's the most moral city in the world. Uh, within five minutes from, well, within five miles uh, of where I live, and certainly within 15 miles where I live, you have all the King family. You have the Andrew Young family who was Dr. King's right arm in the movement. You have Hank Aaron. Uh, you have the homes of the five U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom awardees. Some of them have gone on to glory. Uh, you have effectively civil rights royalty right here within a stone's throw of where I live. You have in the, in the county I'm in now, a place that was involved in slavery. Uh, but you also have the place that knocked it down because the last uh, battle of the Civil War that broke the back of the Confederates was the March to the Sea, where Atlanta was burned to the ground and the soldiers marched all the way to the sea to finish breaking the spirit of the Confederates. Um, and there's another story, but that pivoted to them going to meet Secretary of War and General Sherman going to meet with 20 ministers in Savannah, Georgia, about two hours from here asking, what do you want? And they, 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 want, they said they wanted a welfare program or whatever. No, they said they wanted land. They wanted to do for themselves. That's, that's where you got that story of 40 acres and a mule right down the street in Savannah, Georgia. So you have uh, the, the foundational story of a, of a state and a city that started off as one of the most racist backwards places in America. And at some point they got their moral uh, footing. And, and then in the 60s, they pivoted. Uh, now, we're the only international city in the South. We're the busiest airport in the world. Uh, there's more black wealth more in a, here in Atlanta than any place, any city in the country. And we have poverty to deal with here too, by the way, but that poverty is about green, not about black or white. Um, and so we have problems, but this place, we, you know, Memphis should have been this place. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama should have been this place. They were larger. They had a better, bigger industrial base. They should have had the airport. But they decided to argue over race, Brian. We decided to argue over money. <laughs> they decided to argue who's going to get in the water fountain, go to the water fountain, black or white. Uh, in some ways, people are still arguing about stupid stuff in certain southern cities in this country. Uh, we decided to argue about who's going to get the money. We attracted the Olympic Games here, uh, uh, and, and that helped to – to spur even more economic growth. I think it was that, that thing that we decided to focus on the green, not on the black or the white, and, um, and be progressive in our view. Every diverse city is an economically pr prosperous city. Let me put that another way. A, a economically prosperous market is a diverse one. And those who decided to argue over stupid stuff like racism, which is scientifically stupid, are really stuck in, in reverse in the transmission of their automobile. You know, Mississippi, as an example, poor city in a state in America, uh, says they hate the government, I guess, um, hate government programs, so on and so forth. This tells you about financial literacy and just literacy in, in general. 41% uh, of their every dollar going into Mississippi is a, gov a federal government dollar. So that just shows you people aren't even reading their own documents. They aren't even clued in on what's driving their own economy. And it's the lowest credit score state in America, Mississippi can't make this up. And so you look at places like the Bay Area, LA, San Francisco, you know, pick the city that's progressive, that has diversity, that salutes it. It's not just a moral statement. The two largest economies in the U.S. are California and New York. New York. The two most diverse places in the U.S. are California and New York. Mm -hmm. The most diverse economy in the southern states is Atlanta. Mm -hmm. It goes on, it goes on, it goes on. Well, let, since you had, you know, before you gave us that answer, said you weren't surprised that Georgia is where it is. What do you think Georgia said in this presidential election? What do you think Georgia will say uh, in January? Where do you, what are you hoping to hear from Georgia? 
I, I think you're seeing, uh, so this doesn't exactly track, and I'm going to use a choice word that hopefully my uh, my friends there at Commonwealth don't get upset with me, but I got to use the word to make the point. Uh, I've always said that Black folks vote twice. This would be, I think that 70% of Black Americans are clinically undiagnosed, depressed because of racism, slavery, Jim Crow. I think that 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 there's a lot of emotional stuff we haven't healed from and still we rise by the way, which is amazing. So over around it through it, we get to it. But I think that because of the depression and because of the bad feelings and the low self-esteem, sometimes I put that in the book, um, we respond differently to, and I think that black folks basically vote in mass when we're proud and we're pissed. <laughs> mm. Mm. And uh, we were proud with Obama. We were pissed this year <laughs> and, um, and but not in an angry way in a you got to be out your mind way <laughs> <laughs> you are out of your cotton picking mind we not we not going back no 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 we just weren't voting because we didn't think it mattered now we know it matters now, now mm-hmm. that we, and now we see what you did when we went on chill mode we went on like pause mode we like you put the car on cruise control y'all got it we good and then we know we saw what you did when we put the car in cruise control. Oh no 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 no! You ran off the ditch with us in it, and then you got out. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> no no we 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 good. <laughs> and I think everybody, <laughs> you know, and um, I think it's just that simple. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it may be a unfortunately a temporary effect um, because you've got to really got to <laughs> you really got to rile us up. Uh, to get us to to stand up like this, no, we we will not be disrespected in this way. Um, and if you look at the map, the national map, it was highly affected by African Americans, highly more so than during the Obama era. You, you know, you laid out the impact that the black community had on this election. Um, very very interesting to see how the black community really made a point of voting even under the circumstances of COVID-19. But I guess I want to use that to pivot and ask you how you think COVID-19, what effect it will have on African-American prosperity, African-Americans' pursuit of the American dream. Yeah, so COVID-19 is either the biggest setback since um, Jim Crow laws, or it's the biggest throw forward of the 21st century. Uh, and what I mean by that is if all we do is what has been done, uh, you got kids that are behind in school by a year, which is probably equal to a half dozen years of cultural engagement. You've got the economy that's, you've got people who are of color who are disproportionately on the front lines in deliveries in at-risk jobs, uh, they are not social distancing. You have people who are of lower income living closer in proximity, apartment houses and things like that. Uh, so they're most at risk. And because of what I call the slave diet of the 17th, 18th uh, century, uh, you have blacks who have preconditions because the stuff that was thrown out the back door by the slave master for us to eat, we turned it into what we call soul food now. Pig feet, hog maws, grits, chicken, fried chicken, hog maws, uh, uh, pork, all this stuff with salt on it. Uh, it tastes great, uh, and we turn a negative into a positive, but it actually is not good for your health. And in uh, in with the COVID moment, it, it qualifies the precondition. It lowers your immune system. So if all we do is what has been done, then we are in really bad shape. And also the economy... Brian, bifurcated in 20, 2020. So you have now the investor economy and the real economy operating in parallel, not operating together. This economy has grown by $300 billion with billionaires alone in wealth in the last 10 months. This one's struggling. And this one has a soft recovery. This one looks like an L, a recession, right? And it feels like a depression. And, and we got to repair the ladder. It's part of the reason I wrote this book. So, but, and technology is just, simply, which is not going to go back. This experience here, it will balance out in 2021 uh, as we can get together again. But this digital thing is not going away. Uh, it just accelerated the movement to digital. We're not, we don't tend to be all that digital in our 
uh, in our cultural lives, black and brown America. So, so now uh, the other side of this is that, you know, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. And if Ambassador Young would say coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. So wait a minute, you had in three, four months in 2020, the worst health pandemic in 120 years, the worst job loss since the Great Depression, economic crisis, and a 400 year old social justice reckoning of black America in three months. That's an accident, that's a coincidence, or is that God sending us a message that we need to reset and, uh, uh, and upgrade our software? And I think that this, uh, as I said, it's a moment. I think it's a third reconstruction. I think we're right in right now starting a third reconstruction. So I see 10 years of, of the fastest building we've ever seen of black wealth, black opportunity, black access, black education, black opportunity, um, because the world's eyes are open. People saw with George Floyd, you talked about that, that dedication. People thought, saw young people who were forced to be at home watching TV. Kids don't go and stay at home and watch the news, right? Everybody was at home watching the news at the same time, Brian, and saw a public lynching. Mm, mm, mm. You can't make this up. No. And everybody was universally uh, disgusted by what they saw, torn up by what they saw with an accidental mobile phone uh, recording. What? So then you have to say, well, how often does this happen? So I, I, I don't see any of this as a, as a true accident. I, I see it as a, you know, rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity, not just a problem. I want to ask you about the opportunities that you've taken advantage of, that you've taken for yourself. Um, since this is up from nothing, can people be a little more familiar with your up from nothing story? Um, how it started for you. You don't have to spend a ton of time on it, but I think it would be good for folks to understand how you got up from nothing. Sure. I, I want to spend as much time as you want to spend on, <laughs> on the topics that matter most. And I, I don't have any need to talk about myself, but I will answer the question. Um, my story is a story of my um, great grandfather, um, who I mentioned in the book, who was a slave, I'm sorry, who was born in 1871 and was probably an illegal slave. Slavery had ended, but as you know, many places carried on that uh, horrible process for decades longer. And, and then when they didn't call it slavery, they called it Jim Crow, which is commercial slavery. And, my, and, my, and, and he was um, uh, a business owner. He, got, he, he sort of escaped that trap through owning a farm. And then my grandfather, my father, um, and, and, and me, we all own businesses. I don't think that's an accident. Uh, my, my mother owned, uh, worked a, a daily job, an hourly job at, at McDonnell Douglas Aircraft, Boeing Aircraft, bought them, but also owned part-time her own business. I don't think that's an accident. Uh, my mother told me she loved me every day of my life. So I had a lot of other problems growing up in South Central LA and Compton, but, but loving myself and feeling like I was somebody was not one of them. And so I had a sense of, yes, I can, and yes, I am, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And before I was 10 years old, I saw the death of my family through divorce, which was about money, mostly. Um, uh, and I saw the death of my best friend uh, and uh, who hung around the wrong people, the wrong culture, wrong environment. And I saw they were in a surviving mindset, talk about the three mindsets in the book. Um, and I saw the death of my play uncle who was murdered in front of me because he was in a survivor's mindset and tried to make some extra money um, and was go sell some weed, marijuana, around the corner from our house uh, to make a few extra bucks. And the drug dealer who saw him said, you're in the wrong neighborhood, you're in my turf, followed him back home, murdered him, dr drove a truck and ran him down and, and drug him down the street with his bicycle underneath while I watched at seven years old. Uh, so by the time I was nine, I had a lot of life experience. All that happened before I was nine. And um, I don't want to, again, waste, spend uh, valuable time. It's not interesting to your audience. But uh, the pivot point for me was when I was nine-ish, going on 10, and a white banker came in my classroom to teach financial literacy. 
in Compton. And I say white banker because most of my other friends' experience with a white male was a negative experience. It was the police shoving them against a patrol car or a detective assuming that they did something wrong. It was some authority figure who questioned them, didn't inform them. Uh, and this banker came in, taught me financial literacy. And I, you know, by the third session, Brian, I was like, excuse me, <laughs> hello, what do you do for a living? And how did you get rich legally? <laughs> mm. Mm. You know, maybe folks watching this are chuckling right now. I guess it's funny, but I was dead serious. <laughs> I had, it's like watching a Martian. I mean, I had who's this dude, a, a, a blue suit, white shirt, red tie. The suit was, you know, it had those stitching in it. Mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. a, it doesn't have stitching in it. It was the, you know, every, it was a, well, not a cheap suit. Detectives wore cheap suits. Yeah. This is a nice suit. This was a real deal suit. Real deal. The detectives wore the polyester deal, right? Uh, yeah, a, yeah. Real suit. And I'm like, hey, man, look, I have a nice car in the parking lot. Nobody's chasing you. <laughs> You're not That's running. what you wanted. Yeah, I, what is it you do? He said, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. Hmm. I said, Brian, I said, I don't know what an entrepreneur is. It is a sin that at nine years old, no one ever taught me that word. I don't know what an entrepreneur is, but if you're financing them, it's legal. I'm going to be one. And I opened up the, word, the dictionary. Back then, it wasn't a Google search or Chrome search. It was a dictionary. Entrepreneur, French word, build something from nothing. Take a little bit more risk build something that is outsized and sustainable. Uh, and I said, I want to do that. Uh, I want freedom doing that for the purpose of what? Rebuilding my neighborhoods. I'm tired of seeing my friends die and have prison probation parole as their future uh, resume builder. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and what's that called? Philanthropist. <laughs> I want to become an entrepreneur so I can be a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. That's the case, right? All right. Okay. That, and Early in your answer, you mentioned the, the three mindsets that you say you laid out in the book. I think it would help if we know what those three mindsets are. You Again, you sure. don't have to spend too much time, but like, them so we understand them. Yeah. There's three mindsets and there's also three roles in every family, society, group, organization, company that are successful. And you got to figure out what role you play. But the three mindsets, which is more important than the three roles, are survivor, thriver, and winner. And... Um, Black folks, when we got out of slavery, we uh, in that first Reconstruction, we were we were in a surviving mindset. Just, I mean, just trying to get out of there with our lives, literally surviving mindset. And some of us emerged in the 20th century into a thriving mindset uh, because of the entry into well, World War II allowed us to go into the military and get a profession, become a lawyer, a doctor. All people don't know that the black professions came out of uh, 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 a Philip Randolph integrating the military in 1945. The guy who actually gets credit for the uh, the march on Washington is not Dr. King or the civil rights leaders of the 60s. It was a Philip Randolph in the 40s, which the people don't know. And so he threatened to march and the president said, no, don't. What do you want me to do? He said, integrate the military. So that's where the black middle class started. Then uh, it, it sort of morphed after the civil rights movement when we had access to vote facilities, uh, that was all about access, and it was a getting business. Get an income, get get access to the club, uh, get get you know political freedom, get the vote. Get, it was a getting business, thriving middle class. But now we need a winning mindset. This third reconstruction is about building, and the build in order to build, you need a winner's mindset. Um, and I talk uh, about one of your Bay Area residents, Mike Maples Jr. I, I give a really powerful example in the book of the difference between a winning mindset and the others. Now, today you have, Brian, you have a lot of black folks and other people who got, and just look at our environment now, a surviving mindset, experts in what they're against. And you have not enough people in a thriving mindset, it's a middle class, but it's getting tighter. Uh, folks are too much, too much month at the end of their money. And you got a much smaller group that are concentrated who have this winning mindset. This has to be expanded. Whether you're building a family, building your block back, <laughs> building a, a network of daycare center, daycare centers, building an inner, I don't care what you're building, but this sense of being a builder and, and unlimited possibilities, that's what made America who she is today. But how do we go from one to the other? 
John, how do we go from, you know, maybe having a job that's helping you survive, maybe save a little bit of money. You know, maybe you're delivering packages for Amazon. Maybe, uh, I don't know, you, you do something that is important for society, for the workings of the world around you, but you're not making a lot of money. How do you, and you, and you don't have much saved. How do you go from there to the win, to the winning mindset? I think that's the transition that's hard for folks to get. Well, I think, first of all, the presumption is that winning has to do with money, and it doesn't. Uh, no different than wealth has no, wealth and credit and capital has nothing to do with money. The word capital, I did this in my last book, the memo, which I spoke. Uh, I, you, people can go to the archives and watch my last speech, a discussion of the Commonwealth Club about the memo. But I, in that book, I talk about um, uh, how capital comes with the Latin root word capitas, knowledge in the head. Credit comes with the Latin root word credito, which is credibility. Uh, and, and wealth is a mindset. So none of that has anything to do with Money, I mean, it, I mean, money is not, money is just a means of transferring value. Currency, I'm sorry, is a means of transferring value. But real wealth is inside of yourself. And um, and so I saw you, I believe, with your daughter. Do you have a daughter? I do have a daughter, yeah. but she's pretty young. I, uh... <laughs> I saw a photo with you. I guess it was almost like career day or something. You had your girl on your... Oh, your, uh, like, yeah. Yeah, you're right. You know, and I said, Bingo! That's that's a, that's a winner, and you, you have out what your role is. So the th- I didn't say the I said the roles weren't important. My guests now I'll introduce them. There's three roles: hunter, skinner, and cook. Hmm. So I'm a hunter. I mean, people can sort of figure that out. <laughs> um, the skinner, the preparer. So at uh, uh, at the station there, you have engineers, you have analysts. Um, you know, uh, at, at the Commonwealth Club, you have business management professionals. Those are the, uh, the skinners. The cook is the person that delivers on the, me- so on the message. So at work, you may, you may be the cook. You're delivering on the, on the power of the message that the advertising people sold, the hunters, the advertisers on, or they sold the public on, or sold the mayor on, hey, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. But but you have to deliver. You got to cook it. You got to deliver it. Um, I built a house here, uh, my home office, but my wife turned it into a home. Uh, so both roles are really important, but you got to understand what your role are. They're different. So uh, every successful organization, you got to know what your role is, hunter, skinner, cook. What you don't want to be is a spectator. And, and, and so it's not about whether you're a UPS driver or a FedEx or whoever your, you know, whatever your thing is. Cool, great. Maybe you're getting that income so you can go home and be a hunter. Go home and be the cook. Go home and be you, 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 maybe what you're the, the enterprise you're building, building is a family. I don't care what you're building, as I said earlier, just build something. Uh, but it, but the short answer is it's all mindset. Uh, that 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 success in whatever you're doing starts with the mindset. All wealth except uh, 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 not sustainability, but uh, the, uh, the, the uh, no, sorry, all poverty. This is what I can remember. All poverty except sustenance poverty, which is a roof over your head, food on the table, health care, comes from mindset. All poverty other than sustenance poverty is about mindset. I, I make a million bucks. So I win a million bucks from the lottery, or five million bucks. I give a million dollars to the guy at the uh, the off ramp uh, because I feel sorry for him. I say here, Brian will be broken six months unless something changes here. Here, it won't change here. This is just simply an extension of what I'm thinking. So, so wealth is a mindset. Building is a mindset. Becoming a winner is a mindset. And and you got to have one of the five pillars, which hopefully we'll get into because that's everything. Is self esteem. I'm sort of mixing this stuff up, but it, to me, it all, okay. it's all interrelated and you can't get away from it. Early in your book, uh, you go through a list of countries other than America that you really like. But with each of them, you say that if you were born in those countries, you would not have become the person that you became. Why is that? What is it about 
America that makes your story possible. Because in those other places, you got to believe in something else and bow down to it and kiss it <laughs> and, and honor it. Whereas America, you have to believe in yourself. You know, if you're uh, if you're part of uh, if you're in Europe, then you've got to bow down to European royalty and a bloodline and a, and a cultural process. And if you're in um, Saudi Arabia and Middle East, you got to bow down to a Saudi prince and a this and a five thousand prince cousins. And you know, <laughs> um, I'm not, by the way, I'm not dissing these places. As, as I said in the book, I I've been to hundred countries. I love most of these places. Um, uh, wherever else in the world. Look, if you're in uh, if you're in China and you say the wrong thing, you disappear. You're in Russia, you say the wrong thing about your president. Imagine if, that somebody said about Putin what we say about the president here on TV. Mm. <laughs> you disappear. In America, it's self determination. Now the now the playing field's not level and the rules aren't published, which is what I'm trying to solve for. Um, where where we where the rules are published in the playing fields level, black folks have killed it. The sports sector, the entertainment sector, uh, we've killed it, the arts, uh, because of the rules are published. But uh, so the other than the fact that everybody else started the monopoly game much further ahead and have an unfair advantage. I mean, people talk about affirmative action. Black people, y'all should not want affirmative action. My white friends have had affirmative action since 1619. It was called slavery. <laughs> 300 years of free labor uh, and reverse, the largest tra reverse transfer of wealth in probably world history because America's the largest economy in the world, certainly in U.S. history. I can go on with this forever. I mean, uh, the farm subsidies to this very day of my white brothers and sisters in rural America is the largest subsidy uh, of transfer pay payment in government does to anybody. Uh, uh, capitalism is effectively, I mean, the Fed, the Fed window, Federal Reserve window, which opened up to make sure Wall Street was cool during COVID-19, that is affirmative action. I mean, uh, so uh, I, I just think that other than Black folks needing some affirmative action on, on capitalism and us needing some, to sort of get the system to sort of have a free flow of opportunity and we need to have the right mindset, that this is the most incredible place on the planet even with racism and bias and all of our drama. In a lot of the places that you, that you say you like, you know, one of the things that you really highlight is a social safety net that they have. You feel like they have done better than the U S at taking care of their people. And yet there's something about that, that means that people can only go so far up, um, can only, get so much richer. Um, Ryan, your, your, your daughter and your children are lucky, man. I mean, you make it smart, sexy. You actually read books. Well, you know. <laughs> you actually think about a question before you ask it. I mean, <laughs> thoughtful questions. Not, you know, I love challenges. So no, go ahead, continue. Well, no, I'm, I, you know, I think that, you know, I just was really drawn because this, this is a moment in your book where you mention socialism, where you acknowledge that there, there are some people in the United States that are attracted to socialism, and you understand that. Um, but do you, do you feel like this is a moment, since socialism is a word that was thrown around a lot by Republicans during this uh, last vote? Are, are we getting close to socialism now that it appears as if we're going to have a new, a new president? Yeah, so it was actually thrown around, thrown around by my Democratic friends. They need to stop it. They need to knock it off. They need to stop. They need to not say it not one more time. Uh, most people don't even know what socialism is. Uh, I mean, by the way, this country, because they're so divided, we really need to not have the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. We have, need to have like the Fuchsia Party right now. Like we, we need the Get It Done Party and it needs to have like a Fuchsia logo. It needs to be blended. Like we, we have got we have we've got to be, as I say in the book, like the only people who win when we fight with each other is Russia, China, North Korea, and everybody who wants to be us. I mean, everybody wants to be an American, but Americans. Um, but let me answer your question. because it's, it's probably the best question that anybody's asked me ever in a book conversation on this book. So uh, it's a really smart question. Most people don't even understand what slow socialism is, <laughs> right? Socialism is the, is the effectively the public or government ownership of private assets. 
So even folks who say they want socialism don't actually want that. <laughs> okay? um, what they want is the rigged system to stop. That's what they want. And so let me go back to the benefits of socialism. And, and even socialism models that we talk about today, they really aren't socialism models. They're just progressive tax models. So in the Nordic countries, everybody wants to talk to, oh, uh, let's look at Norway and Sweden and Finland. Okay, I understand. I, I go there, I, I have friends there, et cetera. Those are capitalist countries engaged in free enterprise, privately owned assets, um, but the tax structure is very aggressive. Uh, and they basically the government says, we're going to be the nanny. So you don't have to, there's not a lot of philanthropy in Europe. We're the most philanthropically generous country in the world, America. There's not a lot of philanthropy in Europe and in these countries because the government takes care of it. The government says, I'm going to take care of the poor and the shut in and the hungry. And so you don't drive down the street. You don't see poor people sitting on the corner. And that's where they get it better than we do. You have universal health care. They, they got it. They got it. By the way, it's a much smaller country, too. So it's, it's, you know, it's easy to get your hands around. A country in Europe is a city in America. Um, but it's easy to get in the hands. So, but, but, so the, there is no, let me get to the answer. No one falls through the cracks. But, but also no one climbs on the roof either. And no one owns the building. You, you don't go from, you don't go in these countries from a poor Ethiopian immigrant that was homeless. I was homeless. And then five or 10 years later, you own a series of buildings in Finland or whatever, shopping center. That doesn't happen because it, it got to kiss the ring. You got to be part of the, you got to be have the, got the right school. You got to have the right, know the right people. You got, it's a class structure there um, that uh, we don't have here in that way. You know, we created a, we created a class structure here in America. It's called business owners. <laughs> um, and we even created our own royalty here because we, have, we, we wanted, we wanted to be like Europe. So we call it, we, we created celebrity. Um, it's an, <laughs> yeah, it, Brian, it's an American. I just love talking about this stuff that people go, you know, I haven't thought about that before. A celebrity is celebrities are an American creation. By the way, I hope you get to the the word white is an American creation. It didn't exist anywhere in the world. But I know I'm getting off into another topic now. So I essentially answered the question that yeah. you you don't fall through the cracks, but you don't climb on the roof and own the building either. Folks in Cuba who get free education come here after they get it. <laughs> Because you don't want some guy, you're working three times as fast as this guy over here, but this guy over here got the promotion you didn't. Well, we, that's not fair. And so people want that sense that if I work hard, play by the rules, it'll pay off in some shot at success or failure of my own merit. And I think that's the American mm -hmm. story. Well, since you, you mentioned success right there, uh, there are five pillars of success that you lay out in your book. And you know, as we get close to the end of this discussion, I want to make sure people joining us can benefit from that. What are the five pillars? And does one come first? Uh, one does not come first. Uh, you can pick any three or four or five of them and pretty much guarantee yourself a success as long as you don't give up. They are immune to racism, bias, sexism, discrimination, uh, exclusion, exclusisms, um, it doesn't matter which you pick, but if you don't have three of these, you are toast. <laughs> um, and I'm going to name all five. Uh, and uh, I want people to, when I name them, I want you to think real closely about the three groups in America that since 1600s have not succeeded as a group. African-Americans, I didn't say Ethiopian Blacks or Caribbean Blacks, I said African-American Blacks, uh, poor whites, and Native American Indians. Now, let me do it. As much education as you can shove down your throat. Understanding the math, financial literacy. How does the system actually work? Free enterprise, capitalism, economics, ownership, opportunity, wealth creation. How does this thing work? It's all around you. I mean, we can't even do this program without First Republic sponsoring it. You can't watch this program unless somebody bought the iPhone or iPad or whatever you're using, Samsung, to watch the program. It's all around you, but nobody understands it. Number three, 
um, uh, family structure and resiliency. Number four, self-esteem and confidence. Now, Brian, I, we, you and I met a couple times. I don't know you really well, but I know you. I've looked at your eyes and I can read you like a book. You have self-esteem and you have confidence. Someone told you in your life they loved you and you believed it. And uh, I don't even need to know your story to know that I can feel it. So self-esteem is how you esteem yourself. If I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'll make your life a living hell. Whatever goes around, comes around. The most dangerous person in the world, the person with no hope. So self-esteem is the whole ball game. But what was robbed of black people in, in, in 246 years of slavery and 100 years almost of Jim Crow? Self-esteem. Confidence is basically competence leaned into a job task that gives you a reward or a feedback loop that creates confidence. So can you have, Brian, confidence and high confidence and low self-esteem? Yes, you can. In mm. fact, the dangerous person you can run into is not just the person with no hope. It's a person who has high confidence, high wealth, power, low self-esteem, and fear. Now think about who that is. Don't mention a word. Don't mention a name. But there are leaders that describe that I've just described. And the I last, yeah, we won't get into. But the but it's interesting how easy that was. The last piece of that is role models and environment. So you model what you see, and uh, that's why I love that your daughter was on your lap at career day. And and if you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the tenth. Well, those are those are the. Five. Now, you, you can pick any three of those or four. Uh, pick uh, education, family structure, resiliency, self-esteem, and confidence. Pick uh, math, self-esteem, and confidence, and role models, self-esteem, and confidence, and, and, yeah, self -esteem and, confidence and role models. Pick uh, the math, family, and self-esteem. Pick, I mean, it doesn't matter which, pick education, family, res and resiliency, self-esteem, and confidence. It doesn't matter which three. Three, and you got a baseline. Four, and why did my Jewish friends who were, targeted for extermination in, uh, with, with, with Hitler's reign, how did they survive a third of them being an attempt to wipe them off the map? Because they had all five of these before the extermination attempt and had all five of them after. Mm. Period. In the subject. I mean, it's not complicated, really. You can break this down. I love math because it doesn't have an opinion, right? You can break this stuff down and so that you can get your hands around. That's why I love credit scores. You can you know, uh, half of black folks have credit score below 620. Stop there. First Republic can't give them a loan, no matter how much they want them to. You, you, can't, you can't get a loan to start a business that requires a 700 credit score. Okay, how good your idea is. So you're locked out of the free enterprise system. And who's preying on you if you have a fire credit score? Check cashers, payday loan lenders, rent to own stores, title lenders, liquor stores, pawn shops, all preying on you in a 500 credit score neighborhood. And it appears the police, who, by the way, if you go back 200 years, uh, uh, Lincoln said he was exhausted after the Civil War. Like, we don't have time for these trials. I'll tell you what, you know, Confederates, you know, take your take your gun, take your horse. I trust you. Go home, be a farmer. He says these folks said, "Look, this war ain't over. You crazy, Lincoln? You're an idealist. I'm going home and becoming the sheriff." Mm. <laughs> the clan at night. Mm. Someone wants to know what do you mean by no buts in the way people see you. So when you're black, you're born on probation. <laughs> you got to be twice as smart, twice as, twice as intelligent, twice as well-prepared, get up twice as early, step twice as late, work twice as hard. And, I, and that's okay. I, I, that just makes me better. Uh, haters make me better. But I realize, but, and I realize that when I walk out of a room, they can't say, you know, I like that John Bryant, but, you know, I would, I would invest with that John Bryant, that Operation Hope, but. You know, I respect what they do, but the butt's a killer. You'll never get the deal done. So <laughs> now you can say, and you can say, you know, you know, I like that guy. I respect him or whatever. I don't like him, but I do respect him. And, you know, he's a little cocky or whatever. You know, I don't like the way he dresses, whatever. You know, but that, you know, that doesn't matter. Now that butt I'll handle, but that doesn't matter. I don't mind that one, but, but 
a material butt is a is a prosperity killer. So I just worked really hard to just be smartest guy in the room when I walk in the room and more and most competent. And I have a history of a track record. I have annual audited financial statements. I have a good credit score. And when I screw up, I acknowledge and admit it. You can't tell me I'm a bum. I'm going to tell you I'm a bum before you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about um, that got up was my point. A saint is a sinner that got up. So just acknowledge your just acknowledge that you're not perfect. Everybody knows it anyway. Go ahead. Right. Right. No, it's okay. I hear you. You speak of a lot of remedies, a lot of ways of fixing what's going on, and you you've done a great job sort of pointing out all that we've lived through here in 2020. But I I have to ask you about the divisions. You know. And I think we all do want to focus in some way on the green, but the other colors are very vivid right now. The white, the black, the brown, that's vivid. The, the red and the blue, very, very vivid in the world we live in. How are we going to move towards the green together in this moment when it just feels like we are so divided? It's a mirage. Hmm. You have 70 million Americans who voted for Mr. Trump, even though he dog whistles. Um, even though, now, I, I, let me say this. If my Jewish friends, uh, if I was in a shop in 1939 and I saw my Jewish brother or sister who I waved to and said hello every day, and I saw them being carried off by the Nazis and I knew that wasn't good. Uh, or they said, "Hey, I'm coming back next week for you." I put them in my, I put them in my bunker. I put them in my house. I, I would fall on them to protect them. When in South Central LA, as you know, uh, you had the Rodney King riots, and there was a white guy who was getting pelt, just pilfered by protesters, and black people drug him to safety. Uh, uh, in the middle of all that, uh, I think that's what we sh- we should be each other's brothers and sisters. But we, but 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 there's a moral switch that's not going on right now. We should say no. no our president can't dog whistle. Uh, our, we can't do play these these division games. When you when you hurt my black or brown brothers, you hurt me. We're all we're all one family. When that doesn't happen, there's something else going on. Um, uh, and I think what's going on is our wallets. So right now you have a, you have this connection between the wealthy class, the, the the investor class who want who whose markets are whose stock prices have been up like nobody's business. By the way, that was a continuation from Obama into this president. It was a continuation, if you look at any graph. Um, so he rode the wave and give him credit for it. Uh, but they're concerned about their wallet. Then you've got, and, and then you got the poor farmer, sorry, the independent farmer in rural America who likes their independence and don't want the government. So here these two people collide, they, they connect. They, they both don't want government regulation. They both want independence. This farmer may not think they're gonna do any better, but they don't want anybody messing with them. This folks think they can do better and they don't want anybody messing with them. So they connect it. Then you have a group who who's, who don't want world to go to, they want the world to go back the way it used to be. Basically white men, run by white men. That's ignorance. Um, and, and, uh, and so you have power, societal structure and money. Um, uh, and you've got this guy that you, that the people have sort of deputized to say things that they don't want to say themselves. Mr. The, the, the president, the current president. I think that that is a large part of what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's interest. And, uh, and whenever you, we made a mistake in the, in the world, uh, uh, modern mankind, we put our, I think we put our culture inside of our economy versus putting our economy inside of our culture. And we've got to get the business plan back. We've got to understand there's a, you can take no pleasure in the fact there's a, a hole in my end of our boat. If I drown, you drown. We, we're all in this mess together. That racism against black cost America, blacks cost America sixteen trillion dollars in the last twenty years, Brian. That's that's a levy on everybody. That's everybody's GDP. And we just knock it off. It'd be, it would be a five trillion dollar increase in GDP, which would pay for the care the COVID care act. By the way, so I'm suggesting that we're better together. I'm suggesting that diverse markets are more prosperous, or diverse diverse companies are more profitable. I'm going to give racists a better business plan. <laughs> I, I, I want to give backwards folks a better business plan. I want to give, you can't have a country, the largest economy in the world that's half high school educated. By the way, Brian, that's the case right now. 
for how these people who have never who never travel have no limited exposure who have a high school education to be enlightened who, i'm sorry to have an enlightened view of the world and other people that's just irrational we need to make we made education a, taking a public good and made it a private asset that's wrong that's not smart we need to see education that's why i wrote the new marshall plan and said education for all k through college education should be an investment by the public because the, the GDP will grow up to go go up too. The higher more education you have, the more money you make, the more the more you're going to spend in the economy. Uh, so we got to get people educated and exposed. And when you when you do that, racism and bias just sort of walks away. Okay. At least the most. At least most of it. John Hope Bryant, we have uh, had a fantastic Look. discussion here. I got to thank you. This I I love talking to you. It's always it's always a treat. It has been a while. But thank you very much. Thanks very much. John Hope Bryant, entrepreneur, philanthropist, champion for financial literacy, and very importantly in this moment, author of the new book, Up From Nothing, The Untold Story of How We All Succeed. It's available at your local bookstores. It's available online. And thanks also to First Republic Bank for their generous support of today's program. And we thank you, our viewing audience. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual program, visit commonwealthclub.org. I'm Brian Watt of KQBD, and that concludes this program of the Commonwealth Club of California. Thank you, John Hope Bryant, and thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you very much.